Welcome to LPC's Coffee and Collaboration. My name is Jennifer Scheich, and um, I work for Carmen Meadows Park. If you guys haven't muted yourself, you may want to mute yourself at this point. Um, if not, Rachel might be able to help get everybody muted. Um, we're very excited today that we get to have Shelly sitting with us, and Shelly is um, going to talk to us about her experiences working with young people. I think we're all trying to figure out how do we work with this younger generation that's coming up through the ranks and how do we best um, communicate with them and how do we reach out to them. So um, I'm really excited to hear what she has to say. She's got tons of experience and I'm going to let her dig a little bit deeper in introducing herself and letting you guys know a little bit about what she does at Oklahoma State. But basically I think Shelly's no stranger and everybody, everybody knows you Shelly. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad sometimes. Well, I but. think that's good. I think that's good. But with that, um, I will mute myself now and let Shelly get going. If you guys have any questions, please note there's a comment um, tab there at the bottom. So just open up that chat session and ask your questions there and we'll ask Shelly at the end. Okay. With that, good. we'll get going. Okay. Well, greetings and Merry Christmas, everyone. Uh, it is slow in Stillwater today because uh, grades are due at noon today, the students are gone, and it's, it's kind of nice to have that deep breath um, that I think we overlook and don't appreciate enough in education. <laughs> um, not everybody gets that, and we know that, but um, it sure is nice when it comes around for us. So it's also the big sale over in our student union, so everything today is 40% off. So, you know, those of you who are OSU alums, you can text me and I'll make a shopping run for you later, I guess. Anyway, well, I'm excited to, to be on doing this. It's the first time I have done um, one of these because as I shared uh, a little bit ago, we have class during the same time that this occurs. So it's nice to, to get a chance to be involved and especially having been a long time member of LPC, it's still my favorite organization ever. So anyway, but I'll, I'll get right to it. I have been at Oklahoma State University for nearly 28 years. So um, I am definitely older than my students. Uh, like I've been working here longer than they've been alive by quite a bit. <laughs> I'm starting to get full circle with some students who are children of former students, which is an interesting dynamic. But what I, what I've, seen over the years is that while some things change other things stay the same and so that's some of the things I just wanted to kind of touch on. I think one of the most important things we can learn with young people whether it's today or 10 years ago or 10 years in the future is that people want to know that they're cared about and I don't mean you have to be touchy-feely with them per se but that element of trust and I think we all appreciate the opportunity to be trusted and to be with people we trust. And um, I think that when you can show them how much you care um, as in as people and want to be cared about, I think that makes a difference in how they interact with you. I think that does it with everybody, but um, I still remember one of my faculty in my grad program talking about people don't care how much you know until you know they know how much you care. And that's especially true in education, but I think it's true in the workplace too, because if you get down to um, the opportunity to, to interact with someone on a little bit more personal level, I think it breaks down those barriers and works for collaboration that we're also critical in doing. Um, and I think they're more responsive just in general, when that barrier is broken down just a little bit. That's what I found in my classroom. Everybody does it differently, but um, my students call me Shelly. Um, I don't like being called Dr. Sitton. Those of you who know me know that. Um, and that's always been to begin to build collaboration and build respect with actions versus a title. And so that's something you know that's been helpful to me. So again, first key point, with anybody you're working with, I think is no, have them know how much you care. Um, the other thing is, and this is something is probably the key in all of this, uh, is that all of us tend to generalize groups. And I think the young people are definitely not generalizable. Um, you cannot get something to work for every single one of them. They're all different. They all have different things going on. And 
different things that make them tick. And so what I've had to do is step back and try to make sure that I am figuring out what is going to get to work for them. And honestly, that for me can change every semester based on the kids I'm working with. What, how do they want to be communicated with? And so when I start classes, a lot of times I will ask, you know, what, how is it going to be best for you to communicate with me? And I'm always really heavy on talking about that communication is something that as communicators, we tend to not do well enough. We make a lot of assumptions and then we don't get things done like we wanted to because assuming gets us all in trouble. And we talk about that in class. Um, I think that as you realize that they, they collectively, so I'm, I'm kind of talking about those 18 to 23, 24 year olds right now. Um, I think as you look at them, um, they're, again, they're just not one big group that you can always reach in the same way because they come from different backgrounds. Um, but the one thing that is constant is all of them grew up with instant gratification. And they're used to that instant response. Um, I think the thing that drives me the most crazy is when one student will send me three emails within a 24 hour period, rather than giving me time to answer the email. Um, and I'm looking, I just saw that this is down here. Oh, that's where the questions are. Okay, good, that's cool. Um, and any feedback I would love to have, if you wanna type, if you have something to weigh in with, if you wanna put it into the chat, that would be great. But um, when you start looking at them with them all not being alike, uh, I went out today on our group me. So one of the apps the students use a lot, and I'm gonna guess some of you have as well, um, is group me and it can be the bane of our existence sometimes and it also can be the quickest way to communicate with people because again back to the instant gratification they're just they want it now um, i work on them constantly about patience <laughs> you have to build some of that but i think that comes with time more than anything else but because they have been able to you know we waited all week to watch our favorite show and maybe we watched it on uh, a video recorder back in my day and now my goodness you can go back and watch anything that's ever been out there just about so this morning i polled the students on group me so we have 88 of our kids who are on the group me for the act organization so this is our officers but also all the members who signed up for that and so at this point it's at 88 people and I gave them a little over an hour to respond just to see, you know, I intentionally waited to the last minute just to see what I would get. And 20 of the 88 answered. So about 20%, a little over that, less than 25. Um, I put in the options to do phone call, text, email, group me and other. 12 of them said text that if somebody needed to contact them they wanted a text message so that it was right in front of them right now only six said email and two said group me so i thought it was interesting how they responded to that but it also gives you an idea that if you can get 20 percent of them to respond within an hour on a day they're not in school at 8 30 in the morning on group me that's really not necessarily a bad way to go um, i think one thing that i see that we're trying to work on is trying to get them to understand that you have to check email more often than once every two or three days. Um, I think that they make that adaptation as they come along, but it's challenging. Um, and we have online classroom things set up and they don't check those. I think that's the biggest thing. You can't assume that they check anything. Um, you have to go back and cross check and sometimes go, um, to my next point, which is multiple means. Um, a lot of times I'll send them an email and then shoot them a text and say, hey, check your email. Uh, maybe that's spoon feeding, but I'm hoping they get in the habit of checking email a little bit better when they realize just how much stuff is out there. Um, the, um, I wish I had all the answers to this. Um, most of the time, as I said, I ask how people, um, like to be contacted so that I get a better sense for um, what they what they want to do. 
Um, and I apologize that my handy dandy little machine. Can you still hear me? Somebody nod at me if you can still hear me. Okay. Um, I turned off my sound, so that would do that. Um, so anyway, I think the other thing to do when you're starting to communicate with a new person, especially one right out of school, is set your expectations. I'm on a conference call, but I got to get a hug. hug. Sorry. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Sorry. Uh, open door policies work really well to communicate too, because then they just show up like that one did. Um, but I think when you start working with anyone, having clear expectations is a really important thing. So if your company, your organization works with um, young people and everything's communicated in email or everything's communicated through a database system that you're using, um, some of the software that allows you, I, I can't even think of the one we use in our AdCom services unit, but like, is it boot camp? one of those that everything is listed and you have to go out and everybody's assigned things and time in and all that. I think if you set expectations, I think they do meet those. I think they like to please people if we are collectively um, looking at it, but I think we have to teach them how to do that. And I think good internships help that, but we have to go across the board and say, not every school requires internships. Um, we do, uh, I think most do, but not all kids have an internship, even though they should, in my mind. Not all kids have um, a good internship experience, whether that's because they limited themselves or because life interrupted them and they had to do what they could do. So, um, golly, I'm not used to talking this long without somebody chiming in because I'm used to discussions in class. So I think that's where I am on an opening thing. Um, I was looking back at my notes really quickly, but I think the other thing I would just say is just don't try to be like them. Um, we reach a happy medium on uh, conforming. Um, I had to give in and do group me, but I've also not given in the fact that I communicate via email a lot and they better pay attention. So I think it's an expectations thing again, but anyway, questions. So I don't feel like I'm uh, rambling forever. Yeah, same. Thanks, Miss Shike. I appreciate that. Yeah, I was just going to pop on and Do you have just any say other that. recommendations about how you have communicated with uh, new employees at, at this age? Mm, good question. Um, how do you differentiate? how to meet expectations and hand-holding. Well, it's interesting because I just now noticed one of my other comments was to hold them accountable. Um, sometimes they need to fall on their face a little bit to realize we mean business. Um, and the thing I try to do in the classroom that I hope helps when they get to you, um, and I know some of my colleagues do too, is that um, if they're late on an assignment, it's a zero. Um, if they're late on a Cowboy Journal story, for example, it doesn't go in the magazine. And that gets their attention in a hurry. The other thing on group projects is nobody gets a grade until everybody is done. And so I think finding ways to, um, to set those expectations and if, you know, fool me once kind of a thing, shame on me, fool me twice, shame on you, or however that phrase goes, but basically, you give them a chance, um, tell them what you expect. If they fail, you remind them of what you expect. And if they don't do it enough, then they need to go. I think that's the hard part is we can't continue to just spoon feed them to the point they don't know what to do. And we constantly remind them that life is, does not have assignment sheets. Wow, I wish I had a dollar for every time I've said that. Um, I do assignment sheets in my early class and in our uh, capstone courses, we have nothing. Everything's gonna be writing it on the board, but it's, it's interesting. And I don't know how many of you all do this, but they, uh, they have a tendency in the classroom now to take what you've written on the board and take a picture of it, share it in the group me, and then nobody has to write it down. Well, the problem with that, and sometimes I try to, I, a lot of times I won't write anything down anywhere anymore. So they have to try to write it down themselves because you remember better that way. 
Um, I think that what I haven't figured out how to do is get them to be attention to detail anymore. And the accountability there for me is just, if you're not gonna pay attention to details then you're gonna suffer the consequences, reasonable consequences. More questions or comments? Did that answer your question, Casey? Good deal. I also can say I like to put things in writing if I'm in a meeting with a student. Like again, I may not write it on the board where they can all share it. And sometimes I will, it just depends on the day. But the other thing I do is if I'm setting expectations, let's say with a student who's struggling, you know, I expect him to do this, this, and this, and then what am I gonna do? We put it in writing and, and maybe sign off on it, but basically there's something about putting it in and writing what those expectations are um, that makes a big difference. Anyone? Who else is out there? Again, this is my first time doing one of these, so. I think everybody, can you hear me, Shelly? Can you hear me? Yes, we can Jennifer, hear you. Jennifer, got anything oh, else okay. you want to talk <laughs> like, about? Am I speaking to myself? <laughs> Well, I was just trying to think um, because I know that there have been a lot of people, some of the, you know, I've had people from some of the agencies ask about how do they, how do they best reach out to those, um, you know, young graduates who okay, are in some of those roles. Out there. I know you're out there. Oh, so again, <laughs> I'm so used to feedback that it, uh, I'm definitely not a lecturer, believe it or not. I am much more of a, uh, no, I cannot hear you, Jennifer. Maybe that's me. Hang on. Let me, now I can hear. Can you hear now? I can now, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so I guess I was just, there's, there's another question that came up, but what yeah. I was just going to throw in there too is I just, we've had some, some of our um, colleagues from agencies ask, how do we best connect with them? It seems like, you know, maybe some of the younger, the newer graduates that are coming out, they feel like they're having trouble connecting with them through email. And so they, they just had some questions about, do you have any suggestions or ideas on the best way to reach them? Yep. Um, let me answer this one. I'll come back to that. Um, okay. Crave constant feedback. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're right. Um, you're going to think I'm crazy, but two, the two best books that I have read that have actually helped me learn how to deal with people in general, um, one is The Five Love Languages, because I think it may be youth and it may just be the type of person they are if they want constant feedback. Um, Five Love Languages talks about how one of those is um, at positive affirmation, and I think that if you're dealing with someone like that, it's it's knowing where you are and where they are will kind of help that just a little bit. Um, I, I what comes to my mind there is the joke about the fact the guy's been married for 57 years. And he says, you know, I told you I love you at the wedding. I shouldn't have to tell you again. It think I'll let you know when things have changed. Um, I think maybe just coming to some kind of uh, terms of of what's appropriate at that level. I mean, usually my theory is no news is good news. And I don't, I think they lack self-confidence. Like they come across a lot of times, and I hate saying they, but anyway, the younger generation is so used to grades and so used to that constant feedback on Facebook and everything else that I think that's where that constant feedback comes from. And they worry a lot. I would love to say we could wean them off of that, but it just doesn't seem to help. I think letting them know that um, 
if they're doing a good job, keep up the good work, but that it's, they don't, they sh need to, um, wow, how do I describe that? I'm not doing a very good job. All I, all I can say there is just work with them individually um, and say, you know, how can we best communicate that you're not going to get instant feedback on everything or, or feedback on every single little thing that it's okay to move forward. And I, again, I really think that comes back down to one, their love language and two, their um, insecurities. So if they get it, it's a good job, carry on. Cause I think the phrase carry on means more to me than anything. Um, and knowing that nobody's over their shoulder. They're so used to people being over their shoulder and telling them what to do that some days I don't think they know. Um, I think as I watch, um, it started out with helicopter parents and then it became lawnmower parents and now it's bulldozer parents. Um, and I think one of the bigger things is that I see these kids that they can't think without asking mom and trying to get them to wean off of that is another thing that's a big challenge. Um, they think they have to ask their mom or their dad, usually their mom about every single thing. I'm like, look, make this decision. I mean, I get it if mom and dad are paying for it, but you're an adult. Reminding them that they're an adult doesn't hurt anything either. And, and it does get better. I mean, I have a 23 year old who's working, been working about 10 months and I can really see the difference you know, when he started out, it was constant stuff. And now he's sort of settled in. And I think sometimes too, giving them that time to settle in makes a big difference. Um, back to Jennifer's question on, oh, what was the second book? Oh, you're right, I didn't say. Um, hang on, five love languages. Oh, men are like waffles, women are like spaghetti. Men are like waffles, women are like spaghetti. And I was trying to look in my bookcase if I have one. So this is the five love languages book. And I was looking to see if I had the other one here. Sorry, I do not, it's at home. Um, they're both Christian based books. So not trying to uh, be an evangelizer there, but that is that is where they're based in. Um, but the, the one talks about how um, guys um, tend to work on one thing at a time and they're very car compartmentalized. So basically the, the little squares in a waffle and you know, you gotta get into their square or move their square or cube. And we women are like spaghetti in that one little thing will turn us and go on some rabbit trail somewhere else. And you see me do that in this presentation. Every little thing will jog something else and staying focused is tough. And when you really get a handle on how that works, it's a little easier. And so I think in particular, um, if you're working with young people, well, your other colleagues as well, of the opposite um, sex, then it makes it easier to understand how their brains think. Um, it's definitely helped me in the classroom with the few guys that I have that I realize that I have to track back um, a little bit more, which I'm not always good at. So that get what you needed. Probably so. So then the other question was how to get people's attention, Jennifer. Is that what it was on yeah. email? Yes. So or, I think that the, the email. maybe it's not email, you know, but I feel like a lot of us email is the easier way for us to be able mm -hmm. to communicate. So do we need to change? Well, you know, I think it's got to be give and take on both. I mean, I look at how my parents communicated and then how I communicate and then how my son communicates. And I think you have to be able to communicate with multiple generations. We talk all the time about who our audience is. And I don't think that can be lip service. I think we truly have to understand how our audience communicates, which I think is what you're doing right now. You know, how do you communicate with them? Um, and I use my kids as an example. I do a lot more texting um, than I do calling um, 
because they do have their phones with them all the time, but they don't necessarily check email. So I think sometimes, well, the other thing is a lot of them are not comfortable on the phone. And if a lot of them were sitting here talking to you on this, they'd be absolutely per petrified, um, which is not me at all. But, you know, everybody, again, everybody's different. I have watched Jacob and I'll use him as because I raised him. And I know that the older he got, the more I had to answer the question, why? Doesn't take things at face value. You know, my generation, if two, if our teachers told us two plus two was four, that's it, we're done. It is, don't question it. Um, not this generation. Um, they want to know why. And unfortunately, sometimes they want to know what's in it for them. So sometimes what I have to do is do a better job of explaining why I need what I need. And sometimes I just have to say uh, that ultimately it doesn't matter why this is what has to happen now i'll explain it later you just got to trust me and it goes back full circle to the trust me part um you would not believe this those of you who know me um because i am a talker that jacob hates to talk on the phone detests it he's pretty typical for that generation that they just do not talk on the phone they would really prefer some other way. So I think calling an office phone, if they have one, where they are forced to pick up the phone and talk to you and then tell them, hey, I sent you an email. Sometimes it's that jogging their memory to know the email is there. I do not think as much as they try to tell you that they don't want to talk, I don't think sending them an email and expecting them to see it is the way to get through to them. I think you have to reach out to them in other ways. Um, to answer the question of the agency and those kinds of things. I really think you've got to connect with them on some other level and say, hey, I'm going to document this in an email. I think, I think your point on the phone call is pretty interesting. My, my husband had a bunch of Oh, I'd say they were probably like juniors and seniors in college and he, they needed to like make calls to some potential sponsors for a show they were putting on. And it was terrifying for him. I mean, he pretty much, yeah. he said, I was shot. I was like, I had to tell them how to do their phone call because they just didn't know. And that just seems yeah. crazy to me. But I, I mean, I think you said it too. I mean, it's just, that's not how they communicate as much. And so well, and, we can fight it or we can kind of figure out a way around it, I guess. Yeah. But I, I think they need to be better at those skills, but agreed. we may have to do some of that on the job too. And I think that's the case. I don't think we have a way at the university level to force them to make phone calls very mm -hmm. often. I mean, I just don't think right. we do where, because they're not tied to a desk where there's a phone that's going to ring. Um, and I think that's an adaptation. Um, what's so funny about what you just said too, though, <laughs> is that, I'm thinking about Cowboy Journal and when I asked them to sell a sponsorship for the magazine, they all want to email or if they're trying to set up an interview with a faculty member, they want to email and it's like, yeah, but you don't answer your email and you want them to answer theirs. Um, I, what I try to teach them is a two way street and that face to face is better. So I have some rules that they have to go in person to track people down um, if they're in town. Um, and that they're supposed to send an email and do a follow-up phone call. And I cross-check with those sponsors to see if it's happening. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Do you guys have any other questions for Shelly? Shelly, that's actually quite a few questions for us. We're sometimes oh, really quiet, even though we're communicators, but, but that actually is pretty good. Oh, looks like you got one more. Okay. Do you have any tips on teaching phone etiquette at a professional social function? So let me see if I understand the question, Casey. Are you saying, should we do a workshop on phone etiquette? Or are you asking me to give you, I, I'm not 100% sure about your here, I'll, I'll just speak. Um, okay, there. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Hello. Um, we've had some issues with former interns 
like we're at a conference, there's a luncheon, it's a good opportunity to network. Oh, got it. How, without, I guess, is there a tactful way to say, stay off your phone for these? You know what's funny about that though, is that as I have watched meetings, we professionals are quite honestly just as bad. It's true. And, and what I hear from students is you expect us to do this and you hold us accountable, but then nobody's holding the professionals accountable. And wow, that hurt because they were talking about me <laughs> because I, I have been guilty of being on my phone when I probably shouldn't be. I, I'm not sure there's anybody who can't say that. Um, what we have gone to at times is what we call phone jail. Um, and some kids are just in pain if they don't have that phone. But I agree with you. There are times we just need to put it away and just set it on silent and go. And we have done exercises in class. Scott Vernon gets credit for this one that he has them leave all the sound on and put their phones in a box and see how many times they ring, ding, or vibrate or anything else for an hour. It's unreal how many times it'll go off. Um, I've done it once and I think with 24 students, we had close to 60 or 70 um, rings or dings in an hour. It was nuts, um, none of which couldn't wait. So I think maybe, <laughs> it sounds kind of silly, but you have to wonder if at a professional luncheon that we have boxes on the table instead of flowers that are uh, phone jail. And then when you get your phone out of phone jail at the end of the thing, maybe there's some kind of a prize at the bottom. I don't know, something. But I think that's a piece. The other thing I think of is where my mind was going is on the professional etiquette of how you leave a phone message. So one of the things I've always taught students or tried to is leave your phone number twice. And they've gotten so used to the fact that all the technology shows the correct number or records the number when you record a voicemail that they don't do it very often. But how many times have you had to go back and re-listen or do something to get a phone number? And when you say it twice, you're much more likely to go through. So tips like that about how to leave a proper message they're not, a, I think the biggest thing too is students are not at a teachable moment till they're at a teachable moment. I was reading up a little bit before I did this call and it talked about how one of the things people need to understand when the interprofessional world is you don't know what you don't know. And I think we as educators and supervisors need to understand if they appear they don't know something, it's likely they don't. Either somebody told them and they weren't at a teachable moment to learn it or nobody's ever told them. Um, it all depends on what kind of background that they come from. Does that help Casey? Yes, thank you. And by the way, I do not have all the answers. Again, I'm raising two boys that I wonder sometimes how. Although you guys who know Matthew should see Matthew uh, talk to text, it's hilarious. Are any of you guys on Snapchat? Talk Personal, about yes, we don't have a, a company one. No, but just individuals. Now I'm not on there because some days I just don't want to know what they're thinking. Um, but based on what I've watched with kids, I mean that constant again. That's that constant gratification is on Snapchat. It's that instantaneous thing. Um, Instagram, you think about it there in an instant. There's an instant in time. I mean, it is this constant. Thing. And sometimes we're just trying to get them to look away from what they're doing themselves to get what you want them to do. I do think they care, by the way. I do think they want to be good employees. I think we just have to teach them how to be, both by example and with um, encouraging conversations. And so one of the other things I can think about, we're go I'm going back to the one that was, how do you meet expectations and not hand-holding? I think the other thing is that Sometimes when I'm really trying to get through to somebody 
and maybe you guys have done this too, but instead of meeting in my office where it's a top down kind of a thing, we'll just go down the hall to a conference room where it's a more neutral site or we'll go get a cup of coffee where it's a more neutral site where it comes across as more encouraging than managerial, let's say, um, makes all the difference in the world. Anybody else have questions or comments? I'd love to know what you all think that would help us as faculty, you know, anything you can share back um, that might help us of things that, you know, you would love us to, to make sure we mentioned. I can't guarantee everybody will, but I think we're always open to what industry wishes we would do and keep in mind we can't do it all. That's our biggest thing. Every We do any kind of survey about what we are uh, supposed to teach and it's everything but the kitchen sink. <laughs> so narrowing it down sometimes is tough. One thing for us I've noticed um, would be to write down instructions. We don't always type up our, our standard operating procedures. So if I'm gonna walk through something with you, I want them to write it down so I don't have to do it again. Yep. Okay. Which leads to uh, the life has no assignment sheet. Right. And I love that point. Okay. I made a note. Right there. <laughs> I wrote down your instructions. So I'm going to add that into my notes. And there are times I literally will say, take out a piece of paper, every one of you, and write this down now. <laughs> I'm kind of mean sometimes. Mm. And a couple of my alums are on here, so I'm sure they're not going to argue with me on that either. Anybody else? I hope this has been helpful. Well, this has been super helpful, Shelly, and I really appreciate you taking time. I know you're busy and this is kind of a break day for you, so I appreciate you squeezing us into it because I know you deserve a little break after that big semester. So, <laughs> Hey, our magazine's at the printer, so my life is way better. I know. Isn't that joyful? <laughs> <laughs> Every time. Um, but just a reminder that this will be recorded or that this was recorded. We will push this out. So if you guys want to share it with anybody on your team or anybody that you know that wanted to attend, you couldn't be here. That would be great. Um, and I just wanted to promote our next one. I'm sorry. Let me just pull it up right here. I should have had it. Where did I put it? I saved it somewhere special. Yes. I just wanted to double check the date. Um, we are definitely excited for your ideas. We've got a lot of good ideas coming out for 2020, but um, please don't hesitate to pass things our way if you can think of anything else that you would like to, to get on there. Um, but our next one will be January 15th at 10 a.m. And we're going to be, uh, the title of that presentation is going to be Hacking Your Day the PM Way. And so this is going to be fun. This is going to be from somebody from outside of, of livestock publications, outside of ag communications, who um, is a colleague I used to work with at the University of Illinois, and he's now at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. But don't worry, he's not going to talk about those kinds of things. He's just going to talk about ways that we can better manage uh, our days that are constantly under pressure to do more with less. So I'm pretty excited for his take on it. He's, he's a really neat guy. So join us for that one. Um, and if you guys, again, ever have any feedback, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'll leave my email in the chat for you as well. And with that, thank you so much, Shelly. I hope you have a fabulous holiday. Thanks, you too. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas.